everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're here today for the uh, Fly Motions Operation Summer Series. We're going to be looking at how uh, fire rescue teams can use different drones and, and things of that nature in their everyday operations. We've got um, a quick video to show before we introduce uh, who we're going to be working with today. So I'll go ahead and play that. So um, obviously that video was put together by Southern Manatee Fire Rescue Team. And uh, we've got a couple of them with us today who are going to be uh, going over a little bit of what they do. Um, the reason why Fly Motion has put together webinars like this is uh, we wanna bring uh, firsthand knowledge of, of what these drones and different operational techniques are capable of. Um, and this week we are gonna be focusing on fire rescue. Um, my name's Justin Swartz. I work in business development with Fly Motion. And um, again, like I said, my, my biggest job is just uh, bringing new ways to use these tools um, into, into everyday operations. Um, and I'll let Rich go ahead and introduce himself. Thanks, Justin. Uh, again, uh, my name is Rich Katanis. Uh, I'm a firefighter here with Southern Manatee Fire Rescue. Uh, I'm also the UAS coordinator here for, for our fire department. And uh, I'm also the UAS operations manager there with Fly Motion with you guys. So, um, and and then I'll introduce uh, or Chris is right here as well. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, Chris Gould with Southern Manatee Fire Rescue. Um, as you can see by the screen there, I'm a battalion chief right now. Actually, we're currently working on duty. So if we have to, uh, if something catches on fire, <laughs> we may have to leave you guys. We apologize, but we'll only go to the big fires, I promise. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm also the hazardous materials coordinator for Manatee County, and uh, Rich and I developed a uh, UAS program uh, a couple of years back, um, starting off, and we've uh, picked up a few tricks of the trade, uh, and we're hoping to share those uh, with you guys a little bit today. Um, just to give you some, uh, just a little background on who we are and where we're at, um, just to so, uh, give you a little confidence in some of the stuff we're saying. I've been in the business uh, fire service since 1990, I've been on the hazardous materials team since 1995. We only had three uh, three chemicals back then, air, water, and dirt. So um, it's, I've learned a lot since then. Also, too, we're down, uh, just in case you don't know where we're at, we're on the west coast of Florida, just south of Tampa by about an hour, by about 50 miles. We have a bunch of uh, hazards here that keep us busy. One mainly is our port. Um, and we you'll see some videos today where we share some of the uh, live action we have from that. Appreciate it, guys. Before we get started here, Rich will lead us off, but uh, we do have a questions box on the GoToWebinar task pane there. So if you have any questions, um, go ahead and type them in there, and we will get to as many of them as we can um, with about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the webinar. And uh, Rich and Chris will both be answering those questions for you guys. Also, 
this is being recorded, so if you have to step away, this will be on our YouTube channel, hopefully sometime this weekend. Rich, we'll go ahead and uh, start it off. Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, as Chris mentioned, again, guys, we are, we are currently on duty today. Uh, if Hopefully, as long as the county doesn't burn down, we'll still be here to, to uh, help out. Either way, we'll try to keep somebody here to, to, to kind of push on. What we've decided to do in our in our presentation, now this is going to gear a little heavily on the hazmat side, just because that's what we mostly use our UAS for, although we do a lot of different things, which you'll see in the slides, but um, we're kind of heavier on the, on the hazmat side. Uh, we're not going to dive into too much policy and procedures and you know things like that i think that's a whole nother uh animal to to tackle but and that was directed at me by the way <laughs> to kind of keep this under six hours yeah exactly that's what exactly that's for but what we wanted to be able to do is just show you guys some real operational stuff that we've been able to be a part of and how uas systems have helped mitigate that stuff um so some of the stuff's pretty fresh that we haven't really presented yet so you guys are in for a treat just uh getting back to slides now so you know who we are we're we're just, uh, as Chris mentioned, we're just south of Tampa, between Sarasota and Tampa. Most people know those areas. Um, Bradenton's just a little, little section in between there. Um, we do the hazardous materials response for all of Manatee County. Um, we've even branched out to other counties to support. We have mutual aid agreements with other agencies as well. We are a deployable asset, yep. Yep. Uh, drone ops are a part of our hazmat team, and uh, we make those in that our team and our our drones are available to any agencies who could use or need the assistance with the uh, with UAS. Yeah, no um, small, no call too small. Yeah, and uh, and we've we've actually done a lot, quite a bit of mutual aid with different agencies uh, around. Yeah, and that's helped with the um, with selling the program too. As people try to set it up, the fact that we uh, make ourselves available to uh, law enforcement, EMS, uh, anybody that uh, can utilize the service. Um, to assist and that helps sell, sell the program and keep us uh, uh, important within our uh, jurisdictions. Yeah, and we're, uh, as you know, we're, we're, we're deployable asset through Florida Department of Emergency Management, um, which is an emergency program, an emerging program, I should say, for uh, FEMA and start to try to help build that out for a FEMA response or any kind of emergency response. As uh, when he says deployable asset, we actually have, uh, he's also referring to the uh, drone team as a separate entity um, in addition to the deployable asset of the HAZMAT team. So we've been called and asked to uh, stand up and be prepared to respond uh, drone, uh, a drone team in addition to uh, to support other drone teams uh, for a large hurricanes. So I think we were on standby for Houston and for Pensacola. Yeah. Um, so in one of the, the big, I think things that set, sets us apart than, from other agencies out there is we do have a pretty good opportunity here and a, a progressive department that sees drone technology as an emergency technology. But to go along with that, we do a lot of different testing uh, of our systems and what their capabilities are, everything from explosive and flammability testing to decontamination, drone decon stuff. Um, and that's led us into being able to partner with uh, companies like DJI, you know, the world's largest uh, commercial drone manufacturer. They use us for a lot of their development of new products that are coming out. Uh, it's a great relationship we have with them. And so that's, that's yeah. yeah that's, kind of our, that's kind of our thing is we like to be a proving ground. Uh, we like to, uh, we try not to listen to what salesmen say too often. We actually have to see it for ourselves. And when we came up with the idea of utilizing, pushing drones out ahead of our responders um, to let the drone take the risk um, and potentially poisonous, uh, corrosive or uh, explosive atmospheres, we wanted to see what the drones truly were capable of and uh, one of the things we end up doing is basically uh, blowing up a few drones. You might see our YouTube videos where we've tested the flammability right. or the intri how intrinsically safe they can be or possibly are, and then different ways of uh, how the down how the um, how the rotor wash affects uh, gas detector readings. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're going to get to see some of that yeah. too. So I think uh, well, I don't want to get you out ahead ahead of the. Uh, oh, that's true. I'll the give the whole program away. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, and so, uh, by the way, <laughs> and for y'all out there, uh, Rich and I have a lot of stuff we like to share. So uh, we have a little uh, safe word we use to keep each other in check. Uh, what is it? Based? Yeah. So if you hear pineapple, it's just because yep. Chris is rambling again. So yeah, it, it goes with the old age. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we protect a population of nearly 400,000 people here in Manatee County. Um, one of the, the little unknown gems that we have here in this county is we have the second largest North American stockpile of anhydrous ammonia uh, here in, uh, in Manatee County. And that actually was the birth of the uh, drone 
a program was because uh, we were looking to basically do plume tracking. If this thing, if this factory ever had a full on release, we wanted to be able to track where this plume was going and what population was gonna be affected so we could get out ahead and have everybody shelter in place in the appropriate areas or cut off, uh, evacuate everybody. So that's where it came from. And we just kind of, once we started doing that, the capabilities of the drones just started you know, emerging. You know, we have a uh, quite a, a mixture here, a melting pot of different types of industry. So we have a lot of heavy and light industrial complexes, lots of rail that comes through here. You know, major interstate carrying a lot of different products through here. Um, so we we get a we get a good touch of a lot of uh, different yeah. uh, nasties that could possibly. Yeah. And then the here. port, which is yeah. basically an old old. Uh, it was built in an area that didn't have a lot of uh, code enforcement for decades. And we still, to this day, are finding some interesting things that pop up, and we'll show you that. Yeah, later on. we'll show you some of that. Um, but we, we do this a lot of what we do. We document a lot, a lot of videos, um, because we want to be able to share this with other agencies to kind of help get them their programs moving in the right direction and show the different capabilities. Because you know our adage has always been, you know, it's more than just an eye in the sky. You know, use these systems and to help be, I'm sorry, active parts in the mitigation process of your your scene. So. That's kind of why we do this. So we're, we'll, we're going to dive into that a little bit here and show you some of these different different calls that we've run. One of the things I think we kind of helped develop, I know there's a lot of people doing different different metering, remote metering using drones, but I, th I think we really helped pave the way for this to become a, an actual uh, usable asset in, in, in our response. And by just attaching four gas, rad, uh, radiation detectors or chemical detectors, pH papers, test strips, um, we've developed a way to be able to use these these systems as remote monitors, um, and, and we'll give you some more of that uh, yeah. down the, down the road here too. So, yeah. and we build techniques to utilize the drones so they don't get contaminated, still be able to get the information we need without right. getting a full on exposure. And then we also uh, had a demand for a call to find out how we could decon them also if we had to put them into a situation where they are uh, exposed. And, you know, we won't be able to get into all that today, but yeah. let you know that uh, drones can be deconned. There's ways to do it and there's ways to fly them. So you don't need to decon them and get all the intel you need. Yeah. And what you're seeing here is one of our first out units. This is our, uh, our M210, affectionately known as Viper. We name all our drones after Top Gun pilots. Yes, there is a there's Goose a and a Maverick. Goose, obviously, was the first one that went down, which is why we call it Goose. But anyway, so as you can see, that's our sensor array that we fly on the 210 as it is. So that's it's one of our older systems in the in the uh, in the fleet right now. But we have the four gas meter, radiation meter. We carry the chameleon pH test strips on the back. So we basically try to get a lot of the hazmat an answers right out of the out of the gate. Um, flammability, radiation, and chemical of presence. So. Uh, that's what it looks like when we deploy the 210. Yeah. And one of the ideas is that we push this out ahead of the, of the uh, responders um, while they're getting set up and ready to do their thing. Uh, we make sure it's safe for them. One of the driving factors in our decision-making process is uh, what PPE the, uh, the firefighters should be wearing, whether it's uh, thermal protection, which is their bunker gear, or plastic. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we hit on the LEL and the uh, flammabilities, I'm sorry, the flammabilities. Uh, of the cloud that we're flying into. The 210 is just one of the uh, systems that we use. I think that every system uh, has its has a certain place that it excels at. The 210, obviously, its payload capability to be able to carry multiple sensors. The M300, which we just got in, in, uh, in the fleet, is going to be doing that same kind of heavy lift work down the road, but we also have Mavic Duels, or Mavic Enterprise Duel in, in the fleet, and then Mavic Enterprise Zoom as well. We've got a um, Mostly on our hazmat truck, we've got them scattered throughout the district on different uh, apparatus. Uh, so the, w there's always a drone and a pilot within arm's reach in our in our department. I digress. I advantages of drone recon ops. Um, Chris, I'll let you jump in on that uh, one. Yeah, the uh, the challenge we have with uh, with hazmat is before you can put the first human being close to a scene to get an assessment, uh, you have to uh, be able to wash them off um, in case they get exposed. So we have probably 15 minutes, 30 minutes worth of setting up a decon, establishing a water supply that's 10, uh, anywhere that's up to you know, five to six human beings being dedicated to that process alone, having a backup team in place. There's a lot of time consuming things, whereas a drone, you can pull it out of the compartment, throw some meters on it, do the little dance to get the, uh, get the compass orientated. Compass calibration. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then fly it into the hot zone. And from there, as you can see on this, uh, on this picture, this is our hazmat unit. And this TV set here is now right there 
um, next to the dress out area where our firefighters are actually getting to see the the situation. They can now figure out whether it's a broken pipe, what tools they need to take in to mitigate it, looking for victims. Uh, the drone can actually locate the victims and hover over them so the responders know exactly where to walk to in case there's a maze or some uh, horizontal obstructions. Um, those are the kind of things that are really big time savers because um, he's about to pineapple me. I am. The challenge that we have with the <laughs> responders is they only have about 15 minutes of working time from the time they go on air, walk to the incident, do 15 minutes worth of work, and then they have to walk back out, and then they have to go through another 15 minutes of decon. So we're, they only get about one-third to one-fourth of the air supply for actual getting work done, whereas the drone can keep going and going yep. and going. We're going to jump right into one of the case studies. This is a uh, anhydrous ammonia leak that took place uh, in Sarasota County, which is just south of us. Um, we were we were asked to mutual aid with Sarasota on this call. The uh, we use the DJI Magic Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. Uh, we use it as an ISR platform, and also we were using that to help search for the leak. And I'll, uh, Chris, you want to give a little more detail on the actual call? Yeah, yeah. This was um, actually a, a Winn Dixie uh, food distribution center. It's probably about two or three acres under a roof of refrigeration. The refrigeration is just thousands of pounds of ammonia being circulated back and forth to keep everything clean and just uh, cold yeah sorry let me jump and just so that in case anybody doesn't under, know uh, ammonia our anhydrous ammonia is used as a refrigerant in these large facilities because it uh it can cool rapidly and mm -hmm. uh it's cheap <laughs> over the years the uh, the surrounding area built into it and there's neighborhoods adjacent to this location one morning the uh personnel come on uh the uh management came on scene smelled ammonia in the parking lot realized they had a release the problem that they had is they couldn't figure out where it was coming from so they called the hazmat team we uh got an invite to the party and we were able to fly our drone over the top of this uh, over the top of this facility using the thermal imager looking for uh, a dark spot uh, because you know with thermal imaging hot glows and cold stuff is uh, is black or dark and within a few minutes, the guys were able to uh, uh, locate a chiller, some piping where this uh, ammonia was coming from. Once they were able to do that, we were able to send a team in, isolate the valve, and the problem was solved. Otherwise, traditional going in with meters and walking around would have took a very, very long time in multiple crew rotations, and it would have just been a cluster. Not a cluster, but, you know, a lot of work. Yeah. And so here we got a, if you want to play that video there, um, Justin. So this is the Mavic Dual. Uh, we call it Jester. This one's actually um, a Jester is the name of this aircraft. And you can see on the top of the screen there, you'll see our, our hazmat team as they're uh, making their way inside the structure. But the uh, uh, the chillers there on the rooftop, you'll start to see. It's hard to tell in this video because it is choppy, but there's a cloud coming off of that, co that chiller that we were able to pick up uh, using the Mavic Dual and using the thermal imager. Now, the neat thing is with this with this technique is that any compressed gas, any compressed uh, gas that's turned to a liquid, whether it's ammonia, chlorine, LPG, propane, or whatever, all uh, give off, uh, the gas comes out cold when it leaves the container. And we'll show this to you a little bit later in another video we have, but that's one technique we use as we look for that thermal difference to locate the leaks. And again, if you guys have any questions on any of these slides, because we're going to try to pop, pop through them all quickly, because there's quite a few things we want to show you guys, but just feel free to ask questions about anything you see. Um, so this is a tactic that we started to develop here um, when we realized that the drone that we have, the drones we have, they don't always have to be in the air to be effective, right? We we thought about ways that we could have our entry team just carry the aircraft inside and use that as a visual, a visible link for our command staff to be able to see what's going on in the inside of a structure. Uh, so the Mavic 2 Dual with a spotlight on it was perfect for that with its OcuSync uh, 2.0, which is an extremely strong radio frequency connection. So we very rarely lose any kind of uh, uh, video streaming capabilities. Obviously, the further we we push into a building, then we're going to start to lose that a little bit. But um, sometimes it's just a little even easier just to get the controller a little closer to the uh, um, to the to the opening of the doorway if need be. Yeah. Um, I was just about to throw a pineapple, by the way, guys. Oh. Hey, uh, <laughs> one one really neat thing about this technique is a lot of times as a hazmat team, we may have to respond to um, to basically a laboratory, a clandestine laboratory, where they can be making something as simple as methamphetamine, which is really not a big deal for us. But there are times when people read stuff on the internet and they decide they're going to make their own nerve agents or other kind of things that we nobody else wants. Where this comes in handy is whenever we get a laboratory like that, that's when we have to start getting um, the FBI and other agencies involved. When we can bring, uh, bring in uh, photos 
uh, and uh, send them videos of what the laboratory looks like because um, their response time is sometimes hours before they get on scene. If we can provide them this high definition information, um, uh, that allows them to have their experts look at what they're dealing with and send the appropriate people in the appropriate response. Yeah, and um, so what you're going to see here is basically again our entry team carrying it inside the, to the uh, inside of a, a meth lab or a um, you know this is actually a simulated meth lab. But what's happening is that this is the inside of the command post on our our hazmat squad, and they're able to see what's going on on the inside. So the identification side of it happens very quickly. You know, as we know, radio communication can be a challenge sometimes, but when we have the guys doing the research and stuff and they they can see it visually, it definitely helps. Hey, can you go back one slide real quick? It was a video or the... Uh, just Yeah, back to that last video. Um, another one thing, too, is that with this process inside this is that when it comes to sampling, sometimes you have so much stuff there that to be able to sit inside the command post with your experts, your subject matter experts, you can give directions to your crews as to which is the most crucial piece of... Uh, uh, which is the most crucial substance you need to have tested. A lot of times we want the, we want to test the um, pro the end product, and sometimes we need to test the sometimes we need to get find out what they're using um, beforehand. So that's a big piece right there is for them to be able to communicate that to the team that's inside taking the samples. Right. Um, yeah. So this is again some more advantages of of, a, of drone recon operations. Um, I think we hit on a lot of these actually, uh, you know, being able to uh, have your, your command staff and the folks that are making decisions be able to see stuff visually as opposed to relying specifically on radio communication or having to bring a camera back and see in a camera. Uh, one thing we didn't hit on is that it is cost effective to expose a drone to uh, to uh, to chemicals as opposed to a uh, to sending firefighters in. Uh, the average set of bunker gear with air pack, radio and everything runs about $10,000. Um, if all that equipment gets exposed to something that is uh, uh, that's pretty nasty, that has to be yeah. thrown away. Um, and that's figure, a human inside of that too. And there's a human inside of that, absolutely. Right. So you figure if we operate in a, in uh, teams of two or three, you're looking at twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment that's been trashed just for the first fifteen minutes of recon because they can only spend fifteen minutes in there because of their error. So whereas if you're putting in a ten thousand dollar drone uh, with a camera and everything, it becomes very cost effective very quickly. Yeah, so this is a uh, another case study um, that we uh, uh, that we ran. This was a um, a propane farm in um, what was the city? It was oh, in, this was Sebring, Sebring. Uh, Highlands County. Highlands County, yeah. correct? Yep, Highlands County. So what happened was these a fire had somehow set off, started setting these off, and eventually, as you can see in the pictures, they were all setting off. Now this turned out to be these were missile projectiles flying in the neighborhoods. Uh, 17 structures were burned to the ground. Four, across the street was a mobile home. You can see in the bottom picture there, a mobile home community. 14 of them, yeah. 14 of them were just were literally burned to the ground. Um, after they had asked us to come in and help, they, after the fire was out or they thought it was out, they needed us. They needed help with a drone to kind of look thermally to see if there was anything still burning, if there's anything still leaking, because they were afraid to send their personnel in there yeah. because uh, they didn't know if these things were still burning or, or whatnot. This is literally the next morning, as a matter of fact. So uh, we, we we went down there with our drone team and started flying with the Mavic Duel, and you can start to see the hot spots where there were actually active burning going on in some of those cylinders, and they were able to take care of those individually. Yeah, and for your firefighting guys, you know, um, a propane fire is a lot less hazardous than a propane leak. So where the drone can come in handy here is um, two things. By going over with the thermal imager and using some of the um, different um, filters on the drone, you can find the um, where the cold gas is being escaping, the cold unburned uh, LPG is leaking. Um, also too, with uh, the fact that we have uh, a gas detector mounted to the bottom of it, what we'll do is we can fly down close to that area and then just spin the camera around, watch the gas detector, and see if we have any hits on the flammability on there to see if there is any flammable gas floating around. And once we were able to clear that, then we knew it was safe to send the teams in, uh, the, fire, the local fire department in to start. Uh, yeah, and we've got we've got a video to kind of show that that detection piece a little bit later too. So. Oh, yeah. So this is a... Uh, oh, this is a good one. You yeah, guys will love this. The Florida volcano, we called it here locally, <laughs> but it uh, obviously there's no volcanoes in Florida, at least not that I'm aware of. So this one was, um, we, this one we flew with a DJI Inspire 1 with a MSA 4 gas meter attached using a stinger mount on the on the rear of the aircraft. So this is one of our older systems. 
Um, this was basically, at, at, we got the call. Alex, you, you want to explain what happened? And then Yeah, yeah. Um, this was a mystery. Uh, we get a call to our port. Remember I told you about that old uh, port that didn't have a lot of regulations going on years and years ago? And this is one thing that we inherited, apparently nobody knew about, is there was an old ammonium nitrate storage facility there. They were a distributor and stuff. And they went out of business, and the next owner just put all the uh, – dug a pit and dumped all the ammonium nitrate in there. If you guys aren't familiar with ammonium nitrate, it was one of the things that uh, Timothy McVeigh used out in Oklahoma City to blow up the, um, the government building over there. Uh, you add a few things to it, and it becomes a bomb. In the fire service, we don't fight ammonium nitrate fires because they can be, uh, they can be very, very tricky. We, you know, the guys got the call to this, and the ground is boiling. It's turning to lava, and nobody has a clue as to what's going on, and we don't know how bad or nasty this can be or is it's going to get. So by being able to step back um, down the road, uh, keep our distance we were able to fly the drone in there get a visual on it start getting some uh, some uh, very smart people together with actual eyes on what's going on and then we we're able to determine if the situation was escalating and that's a big deal the drones will let you know if something's escalating or if it's uh, uh, de-escalating Peter now yeah yeah so um, we were seeing this starting to de-escalate so we were able to uh, track our personnel into the scene get some sampling done in addition to what we could do with the um, with the drone and then uh, come up with a way of putting the fire out. But this was, an, a, this was a head scratcher. This was something that you don't see every day. And um, it, we were able to do things the right way in the safest way possible. And um, off we go. Yeah, so the, um, w the initial recon flight we did is we, we visually looked at it to see what was going on. Then we attached the meters to it. And when we flew the meters over there, we were not getting any uh, flammable uh, you know, gases that are coming out of there. Or, uh, any, uh, I think we flew some pH papers as well, and yeah. we weren't getting anything that was r a real high trigger for us. Yeah. And you know, to our credit, the one with the trick with the pH papers is they have to be moist. You have to attach a, a moist sponge to them for them to activate. And on this particular one, our pilot wasn't that familiar with that process, so that, that's that's our bad on that one. Yeah. Um, so, and then once they, once we figured out what it was, uh, based on the, the, you know, the testing and stuff, then we realized, well, the best way to do it was just to kind of deluge it with water. And, and the safest way to do that, as you'll see in the next slide, is we basically backed up the, a ladder truck to it, put the stick out, and just crushed it with water for a few hours. <laughs> um, but that was, that, that made the most sense, the safest way to do it once we, uh, once we identified it. But without the, without the drone being there to be able to get down there and get a lot of that information firsthand, it, it would have been a difficult one or longer. Well, another one too is the plume tracking is if you could look from the, um, from the cloud on the previous was that you're able to send your drone downwind and with the, well, with monitoring equipment you can also see uh, how bad what the concentrations are downwind and you know exactly where to uh, have your have the uh, local citizens shelter in place or evacuate sure and it's a visual and it's a much it's a, a much more accurate thing to use than like cameo or some of those uh, uh, softwares because they kind of there's a lot of input information you have to input that you're kind of guessing at or you don't have that data on the first few minutes of being on scene yeah, so this one, uh, this actually is every every county in America. I think we have these sometimes these hidden homeless camps where folks cities. are, yeah, <laughs> cities. They're 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 literally a city in the woods, and they're they're living back there. And some we know about, some you're aware of, and some you don't. The trouble with these is access is is a big challenge. So with uh, with this particular one, it was in an area where there was quite a few folks living back there, and a fire had broke out. And uh, so the challenge was getting there, and then also trying to control the spread of it because we had a lot of things possibly could be burning in there. And sometimes you're going to get meth labs or some sort of clandestine lab in these back in these woods too. So there's a there's a huge challenge to to the recon side of this. Yeah. And the other part that we had too is that there's not a lot of accountability with uh, you know who's where. Um, people move in and out. Nobody knows who's there at any given time. And we were, um, uh, we were given some indications that there may have been a crime taken on, possibly a murder or an assault. Um, so what we did, if you'll see on the next slide, is we were able to bring in the uh, cadaver dogs. That's actually, we're going to show the fire slide here first. Oh, okay, so this, is, this is what it looks like. So the command staff is able to see this in real time. They see where their host streams are going. Again, you can model the smoke if you're concerned about any kind of schools or anything. And then we can see our, our, our guys down there fighting the fire. And on the top left corner here, you'll start to see a fire that popped up here on the, on the back side. And we were able to pick that up and send somebody over there to stop prevent that from spreading in that direction. So it's just one of those, on the fire side, this is one of those great tools that gives you a lot of uh, advantage by seeing it over, you know, from a bird's eye view.
Now, uh, this is where we uh, we got some intel that there were, this fire resulted as uh, might be um, have been set intentionally to cover up uh, an assault or uh, a homicide. So uh, what we did is we brought in the cadaver dogs, and they they can smell burn victims, they can smell ashes. They're really an amazing resource just to make sure that your scene scene doesn't have any victims left. I've used them on structure fires before, but um, the short answer is is that the the uh, Mavic Duel here uh, was able to provide uh, uh, illuminate the area. And this was a great advantage for the handlers. Mm -hmm. um, they really love the idea of working uh, at night and being able to see their dogs and get a visual on their on the puppies while they're uh, doing uh, their work. And they said it helped facilitate their job a lot. Yeah, the amount of light that that system puts out with that little bit of that little aircraft is is very impressive. It's equivalent to stadium lighting. It is amazing how yeah. much light that little aircraft puts out. Yeah. And the speaker feature on that's also a nice one. Yeah, too. yeah, that's another slide presentation. I think we can get in, we can do a lot on that one. Okay, yeah. Okay. But um, so this uh, this was a uh, couple months ago overturned gasoline tanker, again coming out of the port, which yep. is our favorite place, the port of, Man port of Manatee. Yeah. <laughs> they got a lot of fun stuff in there. Um, uh, the this tanker turning to get onto the interstate uh, just took it too fast and full with a full belly just rolled over on the on the uh, highway there. And started leaking gasoline, so um, we we ran a couple different systems here. This one we ran um, the initial uh, first on site on was the Mavic Duel because it's rapidly deployable. We had a pilot throw that up and take a look what's going on, and then uh, we then we graduated to the 210 with uh, attaching four gas to it because now that's leaking gasoline. We we spotted a leak. Now we needed to be able to monitor the air to make sure that we're not having potential potential flammable. Or, uh, or ignition sources. So, yeah, one thing that was really nice about this, we got some really good video out of this, some close-up video. And the nice thing about the the uh, cameras on these is you can get some close-ups, uh, uh, close-ups from very far away. And one of the videos here, um, we'll sh you'll see the active leak. But what this did was this allowed the crews to step back and be able to see what was leaking. Um, our tactics are we might go in with dome clamps to uh, to secure a leaking dome and solve the problem. Or if we have a, a leak that we can patch from, uh, that we have access to, we might be able to stop that leak patch it or maybe even fill that tank with water and displace the um, displace the gasoline. But that's a tricky thing. You don't yeah. want to do that every time. But here, one nice thing it was, was to be able to see the integrity of our foam blanket by being able to put the, um, land the uh, detector downwind. And we'll show that in the next video. We could see if um, we started getting any um, gas, uh, any flammable gases. Yeah, so that we actually did two tactics here. The first one was we were flying the aircraft around the, uh, uh, the, the tanker to see if we were getting any hits on flammable atmosphere. Um, uh, so we, we, that's part of the tactic is, is just checking all sides of it first. Obviously, downwind is going to be the biggest concern. And then once we figure it out, once we realize, okay, downwind, which direction the wind's going, and we know uh, where we want to put it, it just makes sense now. This is one of the great things about the 210 is being able to land it downrange. I can land it in the hot zone um, and, and let the uh, let the meter just sit there. Now the batteries can last for a while. Yeah, it'll, it'll extend the battery life uh, four to six times. Um, on the Inspires, I think we were looking at um, a 50-minute runtime, but we could sit for about two hours with the meters just running and with the camera running all by itself with the props off. Another advantage on this kind of incident is uh, all the runoff and everything. It's going into a little containment area, but you don't know where the containment area is attached to. So you're able to fly the drone in different directions and check the nearby water sources, the rivers, the ditches, and things like that, and check for contamination that way too to see if it's getting beyond the uh, visual scope of the incident you're at and look at the bigger picture. Um, now, so this one uh, is comes courtesy of uh, a friend of ours, Ryan Putnam, or uh, Putman actually, out in uh, Utah State Fire Marshal. Um, this was a overturned um, or a train derailment way out in the middle of nowhere. And they, they actually used an M210 to fly out there and take a look at the scene. And as you can see, uh, I think on the, on the next slide, uh, the one on the right there, you have some diesel, diesel you can see spilling there. This one you see the the frost in the ground from the the LP uh, liquid propane that was that was blowing off of that. So it's a real mess on this one, um, and uh, this one doesn't have a lot of options for as far as cleanup. You're not going to be able to offload that product, and uh, it's it'd be tricky. It'd be tricky. Yeah. yeah. And the nice thing about it, the one reason why drones are so useful in train derailments is that a lot of times with train derailments they um, they're in uh, places where you don't have a lot of quick access to. 
they're down the railroad tracks or between roadways and things. Uh, so to be able to put the drone, uh, and there's a lot of products, some of these rail cars, if they catch on fire, they can fly up to a mile away if they ignite. So you may not want, you may not be able to get as close as you'd like to to get an assessment. So to be able to fly the drone in there and check this out is a big advantage uh, to get an overall scene. Now, the one thing Ryan said is that he wished he would have had a uh, stinger on there with a uh, yeah, gas detector. Detection, yeah. So he could tell when everything was said and done. Yeah, so and this is just kind of a cool part too. And again, this is, you know, they, they mitigate these scenes in different ways. This one was obviously such a remote area. Keep removing the product, offloading the product back and trying to salvage it was not going to be something they were going to be able to do. And since the property is owned by the uh, rail company, they just decided they wanted to blow it up. And so this is... So, yeah, the next part is nothing to do with hazmat. It's, just, really it's cool. just fun to watch them blow up <laughs> a dozen rail cars full of propane. If the video works right here. Yeah, the video. And now this was a this was a mile away. They detonated this, um, and it doesn't do it justice because you can't really hear it. But the, it ex cool. the explosion <laughs> was is pretty crazy. And you can actually, well, maybe in the full video when you see it on YouTube, you'll be able to it'll hopefully play better. But uh, you'll see the uh, relief valves blowing off, and uh, you know you got black smoke from the diesel, then you got the clean fire burn from the propane, and it's just it's awesome. <laughs> I just yeah. wish I was there to see. It. Yeah, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of the guys in Utah to be able to do something like that for sure. Yeah, so that was. And just to let you know, there's a fine line between uh, suppressionist and uh, arsonist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> fine line. We do appreciate a good fire. Yeah. Therapists would say we've crossed that line. But... Probably, yeah. yeah. So, and, okay, getting back to our when we talked about our testing and what we do and why we do it, uh, a lot of what we want to do is find ways to to utilize these systems in different ways, and this was one of those test that we did we were actually out in utah when we tested this this is how many gallons of, of oh, this is um this can be up to i think they're anywhere from 10 to thirteen thousand gallons on the uh on the mc3 liquid nitrogen of liquid nitrogen yeah uh we just happened to have some laying around and just thought we'd give this a try <laughs> as yeah. ryan put, put this together yeah for us it was really great those guys out there were, were solid and we were actually trying to figure out a way to utilize the uh prop wash from the drones to see if we can use that to facilitate a um, uh, rescue protect our responders or increase visibility while they're working a leak in uh, situations like this where you may have a chemical cloud um, or something as benign as liquid nitrogen. Yeah, so you'll see as the as the aircraft moves through there, you'll see the rotors just create a, a channel uh, pushing that. Now it is liquid nitrogen, so or, or it's, it's now uh, nitrogen gas, but um, it's creating a corridor there that kind of can clear that away. Now, uh, a lot of that's probably evaporating stuff too. But what that showed us is that we can use these systems to start to push down to a certain extent or a certain degree, uh, clean air. If, yeah. if we had a victim down or we needed to identify something that was leaking, by introducing clean air to there, it pushes a lot of that product away and it, it gives us a better uh, view of what's going on down there. Yeah, uh, one neat thing about this is uh, there's a couple things uh, Rich just hit on it is if you had a victim, you could actually displace that nitrogen or whatever the chemical is and provide fresh air to give them some respiratory support. Um, you can also use it to identify to see which victims are uh, untenable or um, are too far gone. Um, and you might have to prioritize which victims get extracted, so that helps. Um, we can also create a corridor uh, bubble around our personnel as they enter to um, help them uh, in their hazmat suits. Uh, Vis visibility. Um, with their visibility as they walk through and it also helps keep the, um, the chemicals off of them. So there, there's a lot of cool things we can do with this. Um, this next slide, I'll leave to Rich. Yeah, no, this is a, this is a pretty neat one because again, the liquid nitrogen is extremely cold. It could be up to minus 200 degrees. Thermal, we're used to wanting to see heat temperatures. Um, uh, it was impressive to be able to see a uh, the, the heat from a firefighter inside of that temperature of that cloud. And it allows you to kind of look and see, look for your victims. Uh, where our concern was is that we know that thermal imaging works when uh, it's, uh, you're in a hot building looking for cold stuff, but we haven't never flip flopped that and look for hot stuff underneath a cloud of uh, yeah. cold gas, you know, you know, sub 100, uh, something less uh, under 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And it works really well. Yeah, and that's that's the X-T2 from uh, the DJI X-T2 that you're seeing there the, on the thermal image there. And speaking to the durability of these units, uh, not because we're sponsored by them or anything like that, but the, uh, every day we use these, I just am impressed with the abuse they take. We sat this thing um, right next to the um, liquid nitrogen as it came out, and we're talking minus 100, minus 150 degrees, and sat it there, and it did not flinch. It ran, everything worked, 
um, it was unaffected by uh, by the by the uh, cold. So we know that if we ever have a situation like this where we have a refrigeration ammonia issue or something like that, we can operate the system in there. We've also blown them up <laughs> and we've tried drowning them too yes, with the decon process all, and they so. hold up. Yeah, so uh, th th again, this is another one of those uh, uh, neat things. And just to kind of touch on how we, we, we the tactics behind radiation and using the drones, um, Radiate drones are built for searching out radiation just because the way radiation leaves, you know, it goes out, the, the detector hanging off the back of it. You can walk it in and uh, I'll let Chris go real quickly on the, the tactics yeah. there. We run an annual drill with the uh, Florida Bureau of Radiation Control and they bring out live samples with us, with them. And uh, we um, played with them one day with this. And uh, it was just amazing that um, these detectors work great for finding radiation. You don't have to get any personnel close to it, um, nor does anybody want to get near a radioactive source. Um, it does not affect the systems. Um, you know, it doesn't affect the uh, radio transmissions, the video transmission, nothing. They were so impressed, they actually got a little mad at us because part of the training is <laughs> they need us to get in our hazmat suits to go do all the sampling. And we're like, we did it all in 10 minutes with the drone. So um, one thing I'll pass on about doing um, doing detection, even uh, especially with radiation, is that the detectors you have to fly, you know, relatively slow with them. But with a radiation detector, if you overfly your uh, if you overfly your uh, your source, it will it will go off and go into alarm, and then you'll uh, they'll stay in alarm. So you'll know that if you the pilot missed the uh, missed the uh, high reading on there it'll stay in alarm and let them know that they did fly overfly a source and then you can just backtrack where you came from and find where your source was. Yeah, this next video too on here will just kind of show you what that looks like when we identify the product with the camera. Um, we can look at the package, let's say it's in a, a box. We can see the package, we can see the isotope that's written on the box, hopefully, um, or the source, there may not be that case, but some of these sensors, some of these sensors now tell us what the, yeah. the, the isotope is. but. Uh, once we get it within three feet, we turn the camera around and uh, look at the meter in real time on the back of the flying off the back of the drone, and it will give us the radiation reading at three feet from there, so we can tell if it's if the aircraft or if the box has been damaged or if radiation is leaking out because of uh, uh, you know some sort of rupture to the packaging or whatnot. Yeah. So yeah. It, it really works well with radiation. Uh, it's almost uh, it's so simple and so. Yeah, it, make, it just makes too much sense to yeah. use it. So, and if uh, you are flying with uh, with gas detectors, one thing I will say is that remember you're limited. Uh, the drones fly very fast, and detectors sniff really slow. Yeah. So whenever you're meeting an area, you need to be in one location for a period of time to allow your sensors to pick up and uh, sniff the area, and then move on to the next. But as if you do with any of your regular um, handheld gas detection with a firefighter walking through a room or whatever. But just keep that in mind that, you know, uh, just to use your same old, same old sampling techniques. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll turn this over to you guys now if you have any questions. I mean, we have a ton of information we want to share. Unfortunately, you know, we're limited by time, but... Um, but we'll make time for your questions. Yeah. We'll make time for your questions. Yeah, so uh, thanks so much, guys, for running through all of that. Uh, a few questions we've got here, I'm assuming stemmed from uh, the videos of you um, blowing up different drones there at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, has there been any intrinsic safe uh, ratings on the M300, and what did you find with the M210? Uh, yeah, so the, okay, we'll start with the M210. The M210, we found, obviously, they're not going to rate their, uh, an intrinsic, give it an intrinsically safe rating on it. The idea, what uh, the purpose behind that was more for us in our own operations to be able to say, hey, if we were to fly this in or near a potentially flammable atmosphere, what would happen? Yeah, and um, the, uh, the the two things, one is uh, the brushless motors that are used are intrinsically safe. Uh, the manufacturers will tell you that, but there's other components involved. So we don't dare say that anything is intrinsically safe. We just did the testing in an explosive atmosphere just to see if we could run them and see if there's any obvious signs of uh, any obvious ignition sources. Right. Um, but what we teach though, is that anytime you're gonna fly into a cloud that you suspect to be uh, flammable, is to uh, start downwind and approach from the area of least contamination and approach towards the source. The idea being is that the source is where the where you're gonna have at some point in time, you're gonna have 100% LEL. That's where you have just the right amount of oxygen mixed with just the right amount of flammable. So the idea is that as you fly from uh, upwind towards the source, 
um, you'll start getting small ticks on your gas detector. And once you get to like uh, the 3% of the lower explosive limit or 4% of the lower explosive limit, you have now have enough of a variance to confirm that you do have a leak. You do have a flammable atmosphere. Uh, a flammable substance in the air. And since you kind of know where the source is, there's no reason to take your yeah. unit, uh, your drone and get any closer to that. Because ultimately um, we're, we're, we're trying to yes identify no. a yes or no, flammable versus non-flammable. Exactly. Right. And then you can fly up, you know, with a can uh, get above it with a camera and then zoom in on where you believe the source is and determine what the leak is or at, what needs to be done to fix it. Yeah, and as for the M300, we haven't done the testing on that yet. The good news is the M300, I think, is even more, I don't want to call it intrinsically safe, but it's it has less potential flammable or ignition sources than the 210 did. It's tighter, right? It's, yeah, it's a higher the, IP rating, yeah. and the ESC valves are, or ESC uh, controls are in a, in a more concealed space, so we'll, we'll probably be doing testing on that soon, too, though. Yeah, but we expect it to be just as, uh, yeah. perform just as well as the 210, but we can't make any promises yet until we do it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, next question here, is a stinger mount for the 300 on the way, and do you have any recommendations for a uh, gas detector payload for that when it arrives <laughs> yeah so the the m300 uh, stinger mount is on the way um and the nice thing about the m300 is it's it's a beast and uh it can carry a lot of weight so the challenge with the 210 was you're limited to your smaller handheld your four inch like your msas and your you know just the smaller sensors whereas the the, the 300 i believe we should not have any problems carrying uh, multi-rays um, and even maybe uh, an array of of different sensors on the back. That's going to be kind of the goal for the the Stinger for the the M300 to be carry multiple different payloads. Yeah, for you hazmat guys out there, um, one challenge we've had is that the Q rays um, are PID meters. They're the kind of the catch all uh, for hazmat response. You know, uh, gas detectors are specific to certain substances, and you can only do um, certain things. Whereas the PID meter kind of gives you a lot broader um, a lot broader <laughs> range of we're gonna let uh, Chris answer the bat phone real quick. I'll, uh, but uh, yeah, so that it is it is on its way. Thank you. Uh, someone was asking where to get those stinger mounts as well. Um, that is a product that Flymotion exclusively makes. In fact, um, Rich actually is the creator of that idea, and that's that's his baby. So uh, that is something you can get here at Flymotion. Our email is down at the bottom there. Sales at flymotionus.com. We will happily take pre-orders for the 300. Um, yeah, and you, we'll, we'll push as soon as we get that developed. Uh, it's like I said, it's in the process, but once that goes out, we'll definitely put some uh, media out there so everybody can see it and see it in action. Um, next question here, Rich. Um, have you had any issues with um, adding the weight of the meters onto the 210? The 210 has, again, as long as there was the, a smaller handheld, um, and most of those, the one, the readily available ones that most agencies carry on their apparatus or their, the, you know, like I said, the MSA or the Altair or any of those um, uh, Ventus Pro, they're all smaller ones. So the weight was never really an issue on the, the you know, uh, 210 V1. The V2 has the, uh, you know, center gravity calibration, which is was a nice feature to help balance that out. What it, the biggest difference you would notice is it will burn your battery a little bit more because you're adding more weight to the aircraft. So that was the, the biggest setback to it. But as you can see in some of those pictures, we were carrying two meters on the 210. And other than a, a difference in the battery time and a little bit of, of the bird's uh, agility, so to speak, like she's not, not not as nimble as she normally would be without those sensors on the back. But uh, you can um, do an inverted flight like they did. Yeah, in we were not inverting. <laughs> okay. Have you uh, have you guys had a chance to test out the H20T thermal to identify gas leaks? If so, um, is it comparable to the XT2? Is it better? Yeah. So uh, the H20T, and here here's the the uh, the funny thing. So we we actually did have some of that. And I wanted to put that in this presentation, but we didn't. It didn't make the cut because we just didn't have enough time. But so one thing about the H20T uh, compared to the XT2 is um, I can say, at least my opinion, I think it is a far superior thermal imaging camera. The amount of detail, the resolution, the refresh rate, all everything about it. Um, we did some testing with compressed natural or uh, a liquid propane gas, and uh, we were able to identify leaks. We could see the propane yes. leaking from the tank. Yes. We could see the liquid lines in the tank. Um, it was much more, I think, again, I'll let Chris add in, but I think it's a higher, much better camera 
uh, a much better sensor, I should say. Yeah, it was, um, we've used thermal imaging before. We have handhelds here at the fire department and um, you know, this, this imager is really good. Almost, it's almost too sensitive sometimes for what we're doing because we don't need, uh, but with this, um, we're able to, we were doing uh, some uh, water injection operations with propane tanks. It's a way of displacing the liquid and letting the water come out the bottom of the tank instead of uh, liquid propane. And we were able to uh, just uh, use the thermal on this, uh, on this drone and it could show you where the water was, where the liquid propane was, where the gaseous propane was, and where we were releasing the gaseous propane out at a, at a different point. It was really one of the best ones I've ever seen. We've been doing this before. And it was even good when we had uh, no propane flowing at all, because that's when you truly get your difference. And that's when you see your thermal differences is when the gas is being released. But there's so much residual from the temperature, um, the existing temperature that you could actually look at the tank from the outside and see how much was left and where it was in the tank. Yeah, and just a real quick comparison, okay? so. The, the X-T2 has a, that MSX feature where you can do a visible light and thermal overlay, which is all we, you know, was, was awesome. It was a great tool to have. The difference with that and the H-20T is the H-20T's thermal resolution, is the resolution on that thermal is, is so far superior. You know, you almost don't even need the MSX overlay. One, it does have the, the, the picture in picture. So you can do that with the H-20T, but the definition, the detail you're getting from uh, the H20T is far superior, so it, I don't necessarily miss the XT2's overlay because of that. So, and one thing just to throw out there on the hazmat side is to remember that some real, a lot of these rail cars for propane and stuff are insulated, and you won't see the true inner skin of the uh, propane tank where it's, the propane's touching the tank. So you may see the outer skin, which won't give you an accurate reading of where it is. But the bobtail trucks and the fixed tanks that are on property right. are the ones where this will really play. Thank you, guys. A couple more questions here before we go. Um, this is a good one. Uh, what are the protocols for decontamination of a drone? Um, and Rich, maybe you can touch on uh, one of the other products that uh, you've championed as well, the drone decontamination kit. Our our, our process with with using a drone in a any kind of hot zone that we we feel that might have a contaminant that could the drone could be contaminated in quick 10 second tour of it when we use the, the any kind of drone in a hot zone and there's a, a chemical or a powder any kind of that we that we're concerned about the decon of it right the the aircraft now never leaves the warm zone so it, all the operations take place from the warm zone the pilots in that cold zone the process of re replacing batteries and any payloads happens in the warm zone with on the, the dirty on the, the dirty side of the decon uh, line uh, and then it can continually operate the aircraft comes back it's done it's out of service now because we don't need it anymore now the aircraft goes into the process where we got to determine if it has a contaminant on it so we would go through our our normal uh procedure to see if if it has de it has a contaminant and at that point it enters into the decon process and the decon process is something we developed uh in conjunction you know southern manatee fly motion and first line technology who who developed a dahlgren decon and using dahlgren which is a basically a chemical applied uh, that kills basically 99.9% .9 of everything out It'll there. It'll kill nerve agents and all those other super nasty things out there. It's like uh, oxyclean on steroids. Yeah, yeah. And in our in our YouTube channel, and I think it's and Fly Motion also has it on their web, your YouTube channel as well. There's videos of that decon process and what that looks like uh, and how the uh, how the Dahlgren decon is applied, how uh, it's wiped down and scrubbed. Uh, rinsed off again and then you, we let it dry for uh, a couple days and then we put it back after we've checked it and make sure it's again obviously there's no contaminants then we put it back in service again yeah the Dahlgren is uh, the advantage it has with Dahlgren is one the soap they sell it's a two-part thing there's a uh, soap component to it which is a slipperier uh, to over to oversimplify it's a much slippery slipperier soap than what's out there uh, normally uh, that helps remove the product two they're using the parasitic acid as the um, uh, to break down the um, break down the chemicals and then what we'll do is um, at the end of it, we apply this all with a uh, electrostatic sprayer, which what it does is the electrostatic sprayer is important. And we utilize uh, this because what it does is much like powder coating, it allows the uh, decontaminant, the solution to get in every crease and crevice of the drone. And it surrounds it like a cloud. And then the molecules are charged electrically. So they stick to every portion of the drone. And it uses a very small amount of liquid as you can tell, since we're dealing with electronics, we want to minimize the amount of liquid, but we also the liquid we put on, we want to be very potent and very destructive to the uh, to the contaminant. 
so that's why the uh, that's why the deco the uh, Dahlgren is a very nice system for us to do. Yeah. Now with that, we'll finish this up with a rinse of um, of distilled water. Distilled water doesn't have anything that conducts electricity, and it's pure water. Pure water doesn't conduct electricity. It's the minerals that are in the water that does. So when it dries, uh, once you rinse everything off and it dries, it doesn't leave any microscopic chunks of nickel or whatever else is in the um, in the uh, water. So that helps keep the circuit boards just that much cleaner if anything does get down to that portion of it. So those are some of the tips and tricks we've used. Yeah, and, and just real quick, and that, that product, that uh, drone decon kit is something that you can find on Flymotion's website. Well, I think we're out of time here, guys. Um, you know, uh, again, anybody who's listening, we're, Flymotion is here to help. We're not here just to sell you on something or make money. If you guys are trying to get a program started, uh, please reach out to us. We'll put you in contact with Rich and and Chris and and see how they can assist you as well with any questions you may have. We, we'd be more than happy to help you out. So give us a call, let us know. Uh, there's a few questions on here that we were not able to get to. Um, we will email you guys directly with answers. Um, I will not be answering those. I'll get these two experts to do that. But again, Rich, Chris, thank you guys so much for taking the time, uh, especially out of your duty day to, to help us out here. We really appreciate it. it means a lot and, and uh, hope everybody uh, sitting at home is staying safe and enjoys their 4th of July weekend and, and got something, uh, got some more knowledge out of this today. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. We appreciate the opportunity to share this. And, uh, and like you said, uh, feel free to hit us up with any questions anybody might have. And thank you to everybody who attended to listen to us babble. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's an <laughs> honor to be able to help out in any way, shape or form. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, attending. Thanks everybody. Happy 4th.